And good afternoon, and welcome to the best track there is. Because here we explore new and novel things and give you things to sort of think about. So with that, um, the topics. So Dr. Harding asked me to sort of do this talk, and the idea was is to, to start out sort of as an umbrella. So this talk is a bit of an umbrella in so much as the rest of the talks will be more directed. And with that, you'll see some use cases of some of the stuff I'm currently working on. And so far, we haven't said the name of the company I work for, which is really good because I'm on vacation right now. And so, but I do work for a company, and probably some of you flew on airplanes probably made by that company. But I live right down the street from here. Um, I've raised uh, seven kids um, in this neighborhood that we're in. And uh, welcome to Arizona. Probably no one's welcomed you yet to Arizona. So I've raised seven kids here. And I live in Seattle. My wife lives here. We commute back and forth each month. Um, so this talk is sort of interesting is because it reminds me of the state. So uh, Arizona has this big ditch called the Grand Canyon. And uh, what's interesting about it is, is that uh, a couple things. One, it's so close. And Arizona is shaped like this. We've got to the north, we've got these big mountains that it goes down to this valley that we're in here. And then there's some mountains to the south of us. So we're in this sort of this flat, deserty area. Uh, but as you go north, uh, you get up to uh, uh, Mount Alexander, you get about 11,000 feet. So it's pretty tall up there. It's about a thousand, thousand foot drop in the water between um, the Grand Canyon and the, uh, the Mexican border. So welcome to Arizona. And this talk is about this, this gap that exists. And think of the gap as being on the left and the right between data architecture and information architecture. Now, we had some need to get across the uh, canyon there. And so it used to be that people would drop down and drive across the top of Hoover Dam, which is just down and off to your right a bit. And so they built this bridge. It's been, I don't know, three or four years now, it seems like. Maybe it's a little longer. Time passes faster as you get older. Um, but this is an interesting story in so much as that you had someone sort of architect the view of what the bridge might look like conceptually, and then someone do the civil or structural architecture, and then another field that did the geotechnical architecture of how that bridge bolts into the wall to make sure it doesn't fall down over time. And so there's this bridging of architecture and engineering here, which is interesting and apparently a pretty stable story. I think uh, by anyone's argument, you could imagine that's probably a pretty stable structure although when it's windy, it's quite the ride across there. So this talk is about bridging this gap, if you will, between information architecture and data architecture. Many of us have been around the tow gap trades for a long time. Often we'll think of information architecture as a child of data architecture. Can you imagine such a thing? Maybe you can, because that's what we've been saying for a long time. But I think it's become just the other. And in fact, when I was a kid, I used to go to the library. And some of you are over the age of 30, not very many of you. Uh, but the idea is that you go into the library and you pull out the card catalog. Does anybody remember those things? Yeah. Wow, there's a few of you. And so you pull those out and you look through these index cards to find stuff. And the Dewey Decimal System tells you how to find the row, rack, bin, and shelf in order to find a product. Well, today, librarians need a little bit more than that. They'd like to find out the number of dogs and all the books that are in the library that includes structured data and books non-structured data and films and tapes and so on. And how do you do that? How do you move from this world of structure and cards and library science to information science to link data that's across that fabric? And how does IT support that? Well, if you can imagine, that's a Grand Canyon. <laughs> and that's what we're here to sort of uh, run through. So to start with a little bit of vocabulary, since I use these words, especially one and two quite a bit, the notion of ontology, this listing and namings of pieces of information. Um, so the notion is that we classify data, use it according to some vocabulary that's been named beforehand, and then we tag it, and then the idea is that we'll call that ontology. So for instance, I can go into um, write a piece of machine learning or machine code, and what it might be is that it might uh, listen to some, uh, uh, speaking of industry, agriculture, and it could be some tables, if you will, of agricultural data, maybe crop harvest in Iowa. And I can stream that data through my code. And the idea is that I'm going to look for nouns so that I can classify those nouns as having something to do with architecture or agriculture. And when I find them, I'll tag them with a name. I'll be corn or tomatoes or whatever. And so that's the notion of being able to build a vocabulary that's directed. And we call that an ontology. Um, I'll say further that, that mostly in the world that I personally work with these days, I have uh, handlers or bosses that would like us to have maniacal ontologies. 
These are managed ontologies that we try to make sure that everything is in the subset. If another word shows up like bucket, bucket is probably not part of an agricultural ontology. So it's a variance that it would be outside that set. Um, taxonomy. Well, from high school, you probably learned about phylum chordata and humans and backbones and non-backbones and bugs and all these sorts of things down to jellyfish. And that was a nice story because it linked all that ontology to a bigger framework. So a taxonomy is sort of a bigger arrangement of things into categories. The Industrial Internet Consortium, you've heard that name a few times yesterday and today, is, uh, is a subgroup of the uh, OMG, our sister or competitor or sister organization, I suppose. And the OMG has the Industrial Internet Consortium. And one of the things that they do is they do uh, test beds of particular kinds of projects that companies are interested in. I believe there's about 30 of them today. And they also do vocabulary. And the beauty of that is they have vocabulary with instances of things. And that provides a taxonomy of vocabularies. And those individual vocabularies, of course, are ontologies. And now sort of when we mix and match and try to prioritize things and look at latency and cost and interoperability, that's called a choreography of taxonomic objects. So um, as an enterprise architect, on the left is what I think I do. And you might laugh, but this is what I think I do. I think enterprise architecture looks at global events and drivers. First off, I should take, let's take a step back. Enterprise architects are sort of like the family counselors of anybody's business. That's what we do. We listen to people's problems. And we try to fix it and get it back on track. And so I don't really do this work. I <laughs> fix somebody else's. So companies look at global events and drivers. And from that, they try to detect some kind of strategy they can get in order to be profitable or to earn value for those particular problems in, in, in with their uh, companies. And they do that by employing their capabilities. Capabilities being work that they do. Investments with humans that, or machines and systems that they put together in order to do work. And this is capabilities. And they apply information products to those capabilities, also called IP. I know it's overloaded, I'm sorry. But an IP in the information architecture world is an information product. And underneath those are data models, and data models have, have essentially data in them, and data with context is the value generated that goes up the stack. Now, imagine your enterprise with information and business architects, all these things that are on the left, and this is this little cartoon here. Bill, sales going great, but we're getting low on stuff. Well, why don't you make another run to the landfill and bring back whatever you can get your hands on? And that's kind of like going to IT, isn't it? You go to IT and there's lots of data, but how do you contextually find stuff? If you go to the library and you go to the card catalog, how do you find how many dogs or how many buckets are in the library? Well, it's a difficult thing to do, and that's a story that we want to look at. So uh, human systems are machines. And why I have that on the left is you'll see in a few minutes, but humans are interesting to anybody's problems. But ultimately, systems are machines. If the same conditions come over and over again, they're pretty perfect. We used to say when I was learning the code that, that code is the only thing perfect because given the same inputs, you always get the same outputs. You put in 2 plus 2, it does addition, and it probably is correct. 2 plus 2 will always equal 4, it's perfect. You can't not unless there's a hardware race condition and blah, 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 you might not get it. But the idea is that humans are the variable and systems and machine theoretically are maybe a little more accurate. But in the world of information architecture, it's this notion of being able to connect people to this content, to this data that's across a vast ecosystem and even multiple ecosystems. And on top, you'll see some of the things that we are increasingly doing in enterprise architecture, working with enterprise architecture, information architecture. So is there a clear site in your organizations from IA to data architecture? There's a link there for the uh, University of Washington's library science program, which is essentially no longer a library science program. It's an information architecture program. They talk about data architecture. They're trying to contain data architecture and patterns. So that said, let's look at a few pictures uh, with standards, because if you're, if you're at this conference, you care about standards. If you're an EA, you care about open group standards and WC3 standards, probably. And so I'll claim that there's a bridge to value if you put these two organizations together. Now, I'd like to think that Open Group has standards for everything, but we just don't. Um, apparently, we've missed out on anybody travel from outside of the United States? Two folks. Oh my gosh, a lot. Um, how many plugs do you have? 
I did 60 countries in 10 years with HP. Um, I have seven different plugs. Apparently the open group messed up and didn't get the notice out that everyone you should have one plug. So um, before we get started, does anyone here, if you imagine all those boxes or applications that are purple to the left and right, that all the problems in the world be solved with API services and microservices. Raise your hand if you think those will solve the world. <laughs> well, pretty much if that's uh, what, 15 or so uh, applications. Imagine 1,000, 40,000 applications and someone draw this up to draw that same map. How silly would that be? So that's not the solution. All the vendors are going to say it's all about APIs, microservices, and services, but all of us know that's not really the case. So for the rest of this slide deck, last two slides, we're going to cover a story that's sort of a journey. The story is about industrial IoT supporting factory products on the left, shipped to a supplier using some kind of IP, some kind of semantic information products. So here in the left, perhaps it's China, India or someplace, they produce some uh, factory parts. Uh, manufacturing did that, and then it goes to some depot by a truck or train, goes on a ship, now it's seen as an export by the company, by China, for instance, and then it's maybe it's going to, say, Seattle, and then it's seen as an import, and then it goes on a train down to Portland, and then maybe it goes to another warehouse, and then it goes over to Intel where they assemble some things. So imagine that sort of a story, and there's some comments there. You can see this picture um, a little bit later from Ron, but this is kind of kicking that off. And there's not a common vocabulary across there. In fact, things will happen along the way that typically we've not known about in the past. So I'm on a big ship, so I went to sea for almost 20 years. And I think I've seen a storm or two. And in that time, I've lost a few containers in the Pacific Ocean. Can you imagine that? We didn't stop to pick it up either. Um, but if you could pick it up, it'd be a little bit waterlogged. And I've been in some storms and seen a few waves, and sometimes they're quite large. And sometimes you can imagine that the ship heels over 35, 40 degrees, and it's a pretty fun ride, swinging back and forth. Imagine your car is inside one of those containers, it's slapping around left and right, getting banged up because the plywood that was holding it to the floor is sort of been ripped off. And then we put that container on the dock and you inspect it, and there's all these dents on both sides of the car. What are you going to do about it? We can turn it into insurance, but you don't know what happened. You have no notion. But you know, today we've got IoT in there, and we can actually have five sensors on most uh, containers because that's an ISO standard. And so we can tell when it reached, when the clonometer rolled, and that information is passed and now it's associated with the bill of lading. But you can imagine, how does that information get passed back to the assembler and back to the factory that sent it, or even to the shipping company, or to you, is the receiver of that product. So there's a vast vocabulary across there, and it's not really a good way, until you get to the end of this talk in the next three, in order to do that. I'm going to show you how that's done, and is in fact being done. Before we do that, we're going to look at a couple, three standards, I said a couple, three. That's not really where it is. We're going we're gonna to we'll look at three start. standards. And so those are the open data format, the open message interface, and the most important, the open data element framework. And these are all open group standards and foundational to information products. Has anyone not heard of these three? Just curious. Wow. We've got to well, make the rest of this talk to you, sir. All right. I'm glad you joined us. And so we'll typically use ODF inside of a thing, an instance of IoT. We use OMI, the message interface, to send data back and forth. And we use ODF to sort of put it all together so we can send messages to heterogeneous objects or to move it outside the IoT space across the edge of the business, if you will. And so we use this envelope story. So OMI is like the envelope that's addressed to and from. The ODF is the structure of the letter that's inside of it. And the ODEF um, allows standard meaning uh, to this envelope, uh, to the content of the letter. And so uh, Rod will show you a little later the periodic chart and how we think of the notion of elements coming together to make compounds or data becoming information. So those uh, three standards are the basis of a lot of this talk. So this is a really simple story of IoT or industrial IoT. And IoT, when I say the word IoT, I often think of it as the consumer way. It doesn't really have to last as long. And when I think of IIoT, it has to have reliability, maintainability over time. And it usually costs a little bit more as well. And it might be a, a difficult environment where I don't want humans to go to and things of that nature. Where's my IoT watch? I don't really care. I can just buy another one easily. 
And so you'll see that I've got ODF, the Open Data Format, and you can see on the right, the OMI, the message interfaces between the two of them. And then on this one on the left, you'll see that the whole stack of ODF with OMI is in there. And that allows you to deal with heterogeneous or homogeneous objects. Now, normally when you draw this picture, if you were just to go online and see this picture, you'd see an IoT gateway and a cloud goes off to some apps. But I've included the semantic rules engine because in my line of work, I'm increasingly doing that. And what I'm doing is I'm classifying that data with machine learning. So as I get that ODEF, ODEF content, what I'm doing is running a piece of machine code. I'm cl classifying that data, trying to understand its vocabulary and how it compares to other known vocabularies. And that variance becomes an event, and I do something about it. Again, I look for known vocabularies by vertical. That's what the industrial consortium is very good at. But there's some other names ones out there for your various uh, industry verticals that you're in. But I look for those words, and now once I can classify and I can tag them, I can say this is a tomato, this is a bucket, this is a kind of dog, whether it's hound or bitch or long-haired or short-haired or whatever it is. Um, I, and all those are kinds of dogs. And I have things like thesauri, multiple thesauruses, in order to compare that too. And once I do that, it means that everything I put in the IoT cloud, I know about. How many times a day do you put stuff in the cloud and you don't know what it is? Isn't that dumb? Can you imagine putting stuff in your basement and you don't know what it is? Oh, is that? That's what you all do anyway. <laughs> is anybody here out in the basement? What's the matter with you? What a bad idea. Do you know where things in your basement? No, don't you lie to me. And so can you imagine putting stuff in the cloud and you don't know what it is? People do that. Everyone does it. Raise your hand if you don't. Of course we but we've got to stop. Good for you, sir. We've got to stop. We should know what we put in there. So the IoT gateway allows us to use machine learning semantic rules through the beauty of ODEF in order to know what we put in the cloud. So we know what's there. And we can mask it and we can encrypt it, but we know what's there. And now I can move that, that data onto my mobile apps or my business applications and demonstrate business value. And if I do business value, now I can measure the relationship between these sensors and the metrology or metrics it produces compared to my strategy, and that's, that's a round trip ticket. And now I've proven business intent, and that's what enterprise architecture I claim is supposed to do, is manage business intent across the enterprise. Okay, so isn't this a mess? You saw this earlier, it wasn't so messy. I hope this doesn't offend anyone, but I'm gonna go through it. Now, I've done some mean things to this beautiful standard. I've extended the little white box. Isn't this beautiful what you can do with graphics? And I've added these little dots here, which you can see from my key, is the industrial IoT. And so the gentleman this morning talked about how you can have sensors down there, and that's just what this is. And you notice I've penciled in ODEF. So now these sensors can talk to each other. They don't have to go up the stack. They can exchange messages between each other because they have the same data model, either homogeneous or heterogeneous. But in any case, we can use ODEF to do that. Or we can send our ODEF packets up to the real-time bus, and we can go into a relational database. Or, and we'll see from the next slide, we can do some even more special things. But once I'm in a, a, a relational database, I can take those encapsulated messages, I can draw them into an RDF graph, which is just an edge and node sort of picture of a thing. And then I can go into some W3C standards like OWL or Sparkle, and from there I can I'm creating information products. Now I semantically understand that data and I can connect that to business capability up to my strategy. Now traditionally this whole picture is what we've done in the factory or in OT. And what we're doing over here has traditionally been the world of IT. And so we put them together, we have OT and IT. And this is what every manufacturing shop I think on the planet is doing. It's OT and IT are coming together to perform one factory. Why? It's because of you and you, you millennials. You're wrecking our broken world. <laughs> and you're making it more efficient. Because when you're executive, do you really want to have OT guys and IT guys? You want to have one bunch. I think you want to have one bunch. Because one bunch is a lot easier to manage than two bunches. Especially if they're different cultures. And so by doing this, we now can turn this into a OTIT party or a singular equation where software is used all over the organization in order to demonstrate value. Now I have over here Open Platform 3 because in that world, 
the open platform allows us to have catalogs. And I typically put Pets Lynn, three catalogs, Pets Lynn, we do with the company I work at, is we have data catalogs, we have product catalogs, we sell products to each other within the organization and manufacturer. We have service catalogs. And you would think that all three of those should talk together. Well, the Open Platform 3 supports this notion of multiple catalogs. And now I can have a complex business ecosystem of multiple catalogs working within the space. I now, I now can start to see that I've got multiple factory locations all tied together because of the Open Platform. So that's OP3 with WC3, with OPATH, the Open Process Automation uh, Forum, with ODEF. So this is a simpler picture of the one of the picture that you just saw that I just redrew an hour ago. So we have your factory up here, sensor data, and we go through Kafka. And you can wake in Kafka, but essentially uh, in the, with Kafka I can subscribe to subjects. From subjects I can run through Spark Streaming, and now this is going to turn into RDF. And now I can do some various things from structured data with Spark SQL, not to be confused with Sparkle, and GraphX. And now I can start to have graphs and I can have um, essentially bar graphs, if you will. And now I can get information from that and use that information to go back and influence the factory. And guess what? Humans may or may not be involved in that. And so this notion of semantic re relevance between resources based on ontological representation. That took me a while to write that down. If you can figure out, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's about as simple as I could say it, but what I'm saying here is from that tagging stuff I was talking about, if we can take our resources and tag it, now I can get semantic relevance because of ODEF. Because ODEF, which you'll soon learn a lot about in a little bit, allows me to take lots of words and give them integers and to wrap them into some XML. So this is a nice simple picture, and it sort of replaces that complex one that we saw earlier. Let's take a picture of a, this is a couple of graphs. In this graph, um, we had a, some graph DD in the last picture. Um, I've got some sensors here. And it's got some temperature and some location and some values and so on. The beauty of an ODEF is it allows me to take that data and then semantically organize it to some words that allow me to use English language to just sort of deal things with it. So the graph can move to your classes and it's in a semantic uh, character in so much as I can use, make sentences and ask questions about it, which you'll see in a second. And this, is, and this context allows me to build these information products. Now, it'll be real clear in a second, but the notion here is you want to think about is the notion of taking um, ODEF, which is encapsulated IoT data, and move it into a way that I can use things like American English. And let's just take a look at that. So, got some questions here, but the last one was that data that you just saw was control data. What controls represent quality limits? The basis of the semantic web is what? You should all yell this out. RDF. The basis of semantic web is RDF. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it, Doctor? <laughs> Dr. Harding loves RDF, as I do, because it's beautiful, because it's three things. Subject, predicate, object, as you remember. Subject, predicate, object. Look at this sentence. Subject, predicate, object. Isn't that beautiful? So the control is my subject. This, this, the verb form is that's represented. It's a condition of what is. And the quality limits are the, are, the, are, the, are the predicate objects. And so now I can take that data that just saw and I can start to have humans write business questions about the data. And so this is really the story of tracing, of taking data architecture and joining it to information architecture. So it's traceable to business value. Now, this seems, I mean, we've covered two years worth of graduate work. 15 minutes. And so I'm going to let that sit for a second because now I'm going to really hopefully blow your hair off. Because this t topic of semantic applications has been fascinating. Because how many, how much, what percentage of your application development time is involved in UX user experience at the front end? Throw out some numbers. 30%, 60%. Twenty-five, more than two digits. Anyway, I mean more than more than so much. a lot of time, a lot of cost. We're trying to figure out what humans want. Well, I claim the following: the semantic application doesn't require a front end until the query is made. Isn't that fascinating? So you know that when we when the, when you have a business strategy, 
and you have a capability you're going to assign to it, you assign it to human systems or machines. And if you give it to a human, they've got a role, and roles answer questions. And the idea is that, that you can go to apqc.org if you haven't seen that one. I think most of us have all seen it lived it. It's the basis of the HR block. But they have the questions for every role. They have 536 questions that they have for CIO. They have, I forgot how many for an aerospace engineer, but they list all the questions. Well, the idea is that we think we have to build the application based on their questions, but I claim that's wrong. I claim with the semantic application, you ask a question in the front end, it's designed, I'm going to prove it in a second. But there's a really lousy definition at the WC3 site. They say it's a term used to describe web-based applications and incorporate principles of WC3 semantic web is RDF, the web ontological language and other metadata standards. Um, I said this, that doesn't require a front end. And a semantic application used by a system or a machine doesn't require a front end, it consumes as data. Now, if you want to see one, I'll show you one in a second. So, uh, this notion is information products are not being exploited yet. How many times, did, how many, has anyone seen the notion of semantic application? A few? Just two? I'm thinking chat box right now. But. Oh, that's good. I mean, that's getting there. I was thinking that's not that good. That's getting really, really close. So watch <laughs> this a minute. Okay, so, but it's going to happen a lot. I think in the next couple of years, it's going to just blow up. So finally, this bridge is really about data to information. We've got this Rube group Goldberg thing going on. But once you have information, you can make decisions, and then you can see what decisions human systems and machines have made, and put that back in the bucket as data, and just, just make this and continuously improve and make it better. But this is the piece that I came to, that's weekend standards. You notice in my previous pictures, there were lots of three-letter acronyms and so on, because those are these things that come from Apache, these other groups. And the great thing is that that's nice, it's working, but we need standards around it. I can't just say things like RDF because people don't often <coughs> get that. We need better ways of doing that. The standards are a way of doing that. And so with that, uh, maybe one more thing. If you have any questions, which we'll do. And then I'm just going to open up the browser because I can. And this is just a browser and <laughs> a command line. Let's see. So I'm going to type in some stuff. Let's see. Um, let's see. Um, Bob Buckethead. Anyone know Bob Buckethead? Now, look how Google has formatted this. Bob Buckethead was my question that I wanted to know about. And I didn't know when I exercised Bob Buckethead what it was going to give me. It gave me back my application as I said. And look, there's, there's an article about Wikipedia. There's some pictures of Bob. There's some videos of Bob. There's a whole way of interfacing with Bob. What else is on here? And then there's the normal stuff that you might see with you. You can see what other people, but this is made at this particular instance in time. If I just, and so if I type um, um, money, no, oh, that guy's ugly. You know, isn't it funny how you get old and you don't know until you look at pictures? <laughs> and so, like, it's, it comes up with a little bit about me, some pictures, some apparently videos they say I was in bunch of pictures and so on. But this whole little application has been made for me based on data that I've entered. Uh, so I've got kids. I've never done this before. I hope they've not misbehaved. Hmm. But look, so apparently this kid right here is related to me. He's a civil engineer. Oh well look at his Facebook. But he does his application looks different than mine. And if you type on somebody that's on a relatively thing, I'm not political, but let's see. Um, is that guy's name? This application, based on the, on the data that Don has put in, has given me back this application that shows all this stuff about this particular person. This is the beginnings of this notion of a semantic web of linked. And so the notion is this linked data. So there's a thing called DBpedia. There's Wikipedia, and the thing behind it is DBpedia, which is a series of collections of URIs. Now the beauty of this from a librarian's perspective, or someone in information science, is I'd like to have a catalog of URIs. That's called what? A semantic catalog. 
Can you imagine a catalog that's for Don or for Ron or for, for Chris that's designed for them that when they press the button, they go to link data? And can you imagine that there's only one kind of data and we're all linking to that? For instance, if you go to Wikipedia, how many articles are there on Joseph Stalin? That'd be the guy from formerly of Russia. Does anyone know the answer to this? No, presumably. Bingo, one, because that's linked data. We'll all go to that same piece of data. And that's the beauty of linked data. So now we can have a semantic web of linked data objects using URIs back to our service data and product catalogs that use those URI, URIs down the stack to our infrastructures. We can tie all together into a big mesh. Now, I'm one minute over. So we're going to take some questions. Yeah, you're good. You're good. So the idea behind this is we're setting sort of this, this foundation, this picture, if you will, for the rest of the afternoon. But the idea is our OP3, and whatever we decide to name it to, if we try to change the name, because it's moving faster. When we came up with Open Platform, I don't know how many years it was, no, but it was a very new concept. But now what's happened is things are starting to change faster. We're starting to deal with autonomous vehicles, autonomous, all kinds of autonomous things. We recently put out a paper about uh, maturity levels of autonomous things. And now we're starting to think about, well, how mature should our ML be when it goes live? Because what if you're writing ML for finding library books and it's, it's five nines compliant and five nines accurate? Well, that means that essentially 5.34 times a year you're not going to find the right library book. What if it's humans? That means six humans will die because of your data, because of your ML. That's probably not tolerable. At least it's not tolerable to me. So this is kind of our story. So the idea is that, that ODEF, encapsulating O9, 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 ODF, inside the OP3 framework, using some of, some of the concepts like OPATH and some of the other ideas we've shown, is the basis of building our semantic web. And I do have to make an apology. About four years ago, five years ago, we were in London, that church place, and we had the CIO. We've, we've been there a few times. Yes. Maybe five, maybe seven, maybe three. Yeah, I don't know. But <laughs> the, I think it was the guy, it was Reagan, Ryan, Reagan, the guy, the CIO guy. I don't remember the guy's name, but he made fun of me. He said, you really should read more. And he was talking about the definitive paper from 2009 on Semantic Web. And so I'm publicly apologizing to him. I, but I've read it a whole bunch of times the last few years. <laughs> because that really is the definitive paper on this notion of moving away from the historical web that looks like a bunch of library books that aren't connected to a semantic web that connects all these, all this linked data with URIs. So we have a less costly, uh, uh, less slow instance of an information space. So things don't cost as much, and they're interoperable. So cost, latency, and interoperability are the three pieces that we want to think about. So that said, um, we've got time for a few questions before we jump into the rest of our afternoon. Thank you. Well, with the advent of uh, the information age and things like fake news that are out there today, where do you think the standard is going to go for data as, as this uh, semantic advances over time? It, are they going to add, um, for instance, a higher quality validation to data collection as part of the, the overall standard to, so they can avoid um, some of the false information that may come out? We're tracking metrics on on false positives that may, sure. may come back? You know, that's like such a fascinating question that we could do a week-long conference and it would just go on for the rest of the year. Right. Because the notion of truth, so in Aristotle and his poetics, he wrote quite a bit, and it seems like every army officer was required at some point in their life or sometime to, to understand truth and, and what it is. And we used to think that truth was this uh, sort of permanent thing that was fixed in concrete, that was immutable, that had universality, and all truth would appeal to all peoples. Turns out that's not even true. Um, it seems like a really good idea that they do more out for us. And so the idea is that in enterprise architecture, we know about the, these, this notion of view and viewpoints. And so we sort of stuck with that story. We recognize that given your uh, viewpoint, you have n number of views on the thing. And, and, and how it turns out of what the truth is for that particular view um, is interesting because it's, there's not a universality to it. There's not a common culture on Earth. Um, the, the, the answers to your question, I can, 
I want to answer in a way that's relevant to us here in the standards world. Um, but before I jump into that, I try to imagine when I think about just what you've asked, if I was standing on Mars looking at Earth. And to me, from Earth, it looks like a bunch of brown people because most of the world is of color. And so when I'm on Earth and I look around and I see how governments and so on are working these days, I see a news that's populated in a different way. I see a fairness model that may be not popular the way that I would if I was standing on Mars looking at Earth. And so this is, the question you're asking is fascinating because how do you rationalize it? I mean, there's not a mutable truth. And how do you register what version of truth you want to see? So I think it's sort of beyond this discussion. But you no, know, I think you and I were on Skype recently. And, you, and I had seen this, someone had developed a piece of program that allowed a former president of the United States to speak in a way that had nothing to do with what he would normally say. But they were able to perfectly film all of Obama's mouth parts moving to actually have him say um, things that we wouldn't have said. So we're to the point now that we can manipulate the truth. And have, do you legislate against those kinds of things? Do you build a world with more laws? Or do you teach people more so that they perhaps don't want to do those kinds of things? So I, don't, I, I can't really answer, answer your question, I suppose, because the answer is so complex. And I keep thinking it's that like if we stick with things like we have free education and everyone in the world is, is educated, things get better, but what do you teach people? I mean, I mean, the U.S. Army taught me, and I don't want anyone to learn those lessons, so that's maybe not a good pattern. So I, don't, I want to give you an answer, but the only thing I think I can rationally say is, is that, that, that we all need ability to stay alive. Um, we all need you know, life that we pursue of happiness, we all need health and education. And what we're seeing in this machine tool space, I personally, and you know, this is what I do for a living, um, I know that it changes the dynamics of jobs in big companies because I'm there and I'm watching it. And you know, one could think that it would make you know companies kinder and so on. I don't know the answer to these because because I know a reality that is not appropriate to this conference, but I don't know the answers to those. Great question. Yeah, I was just thinking, where, where would you put it in the standard? Would it be on the ingestion of data that you develop a standard within that? I can imagine you'd have problems with concerns about um, censorship and First Amendment rights, other things, and computers actually controlling that based sure. on the ingestion part before it became part of the data model. Yeah. And so where would, from a standards perspective, how would we how would we improve quality data? And it may not just be information. Well, what, what would you hide? I mean, you'd have information hiding. You have people hiding information. Correct. And so remember we had robot.txt. So you would set that in your tree so that, you know, a robot would source your tree. And so you put it everywhere. And then you'd have, you know, uh, you know uh, what do you call those boxes? Uh, honey boxes all over the place to try to get people to go to those instead of this one. So we have ways of hiding data. We have ways of hiding information. We have ways of adding vocabulary. We can influence vocabulary. The reason that canonical vocabulary has made sense in the past the factory is because essentially you had one vocabulary. But the one that I deal with quite often is say I'm making an object. We'll say whatever this headset thing is here. So I make this thing, but it's a box of them is supposed to be shipped out tonight. But I'm missing a part. So I go get a comparable part. Does it get the same part ID as the other parts? No. I add a letter X to it, let's say. And then that stays with it, that bill of materials forever. And so that vocabulary is now changed. Then it happens with another part next week. And consequently, my bill of materials has now grown. And this is a real story. Imagination. <coughs> I don't know anything about everyone's. I promise you. So say a 737 that has two million parts on it and 1,200 uh, suppliers. You're constantly dealing with the notion that I finished a plane. I want to fly away to a customer so I have to pay taxes on it. And then what happens to it? I wrote something. And then what happens to it is that uh, I get I have to do part replacements because I didn't have something in my supply chain. So my supply chain mathematics turns in from linear algebra. Not no longer can I do supply chain anymore. Incidentally, with just being able to forecast what's happening and extract it, so forecast it. Right. I have to do complex calculus because now I've got multiple supply chains all happening globally: snow, bad weather, wind storms. 
people running out of gas, somebody's dog getting their homework, all that stuff is happening and affecting my parts getting the supply chain, and I have to take that into account. And so truth becomes sort of this funny story because all information is, is increasingly become available, and how do I put it in a, in a, together in a way that's honest and not trying to hide my contract so that I don't get my place in the assembly line kicked out because I was late for my part. You're wrecking my day. <laughs> I, you know, I, we're, in this room, we're supposed to have these answers. Our executives come to us and they ask us those questions. And so, uh, thanks for the question. Sure. If you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. I'm pressure. Just don't give me that question. <laughs> Does anybody have any other thoughts about this one? I mean, I think that humans ultimately are best when we're regulated at least. But if it's been proven that every once in a while I end up with another wound in my body because of that, then apparently it's not quite true. But I want to believe that it's true. So, and when it comes to developers, I don't want to regulate developers. I, I want to think to compile and then to fulfill the specification. Well, when does the machine become liable from a new perspective with data and information? Oh, that's another that's, question. That is, well, let's run through it. I mean, <laughs> corporations are people in the U.S. So if you're if you're a corporation, apparently, hold on, I've got one for you, because this just happened to you this past year, some of you know the story. What happens with, I'm the CEO and founder of a company in Slovenia, and I hire two assistants, and they happen to be machines. And then I build my org chart, and I'm first in line, and machine A, machine B, they're second and third in line. And I die or sell the company. And they take over. So now machine A is the CEO, machine B is the operating officer. Are they responsible for the company? Well, I think they are. What if it's something that's outside their domain and control or purview? What if they give you the wrong answer? Are they liable? I think they are. So now machines have responsibility. They can help accountable. And if I sue them and they pay up, what if they don't pay? Do I lock them up? Do I have a truck come over in the forklift and pick them up and carry them away? How do I lock them up and secure them? Do I unplug them? What do I do to them? I mean, these are areas of, of humanity that we've not figured out. But but it's real. That actually happened, by the way. It's a test case in the EU. Go read about it. 